Blog Talk Radio. Once in a lifetime does a great author set the stage for a wonderful trip into the minds and lives of their characters. Yvonne Mason doesn't just write books, she crafts memorable experiences. Best-selling true crime fiction author Yvonne Mason will leave you on the edge of your seat and checking behind every corner for the weirdos that only real life can breathe. Find her books on Amazon.com and make sure you check out such titles like Dreamcatcher, Failure Was Never an Option, The Pink Canary, and Silent Screams today. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday night. This is Off the Chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. And of course, that was a piece of shameless promotion. Would I start a show off without a shameless promotion? Please go and check out all of my books on Amazon. There's 17 or 18. I've lost count after so many years, but I can promise you there's something for everybody. There's horror. There's inspiration. There's true crime. There's crime fiction. There is comedy. There is um, anthologies. Oh, there's historical fiction. So there's something for everybody. So go on Amazon, look up Yvonne Mason, and just go start clicking down and order all of my books. You will not be disappointed. I promise you that. Also, the gentleman that does that ad, his name is Chris Dunham, and he is a really good friend of mine. He does fantastic ads. Hook up with him on Facebook and have him do some of your ads. Now, This is our anniversary month, ladies and gentlemen. On July the 27th, this will be our first year completed on this show, which was a five-year dream. I cannot tell you the excitement that I have for this show. It, It never fails to surprise me because you as my listeners and my guests, like my young guest tonight, author David Kummer, Y'all are what makes this show successful. I am just the facilitator. I just have the soundboard and I just have the switchboard and I just do all the legwork and research to get these wonderful people on. But it is because of all of y'all that this show continues to be successful. And I say that because y'all all know how I feel about numbers. And ladies and gentlemen, when I ran the numbers, I have to thank the country of Australia. You guys are magnificent. You are 98% of my listening base. I mean, absolutely magnificent. But just on this show, ladies and gentlemen, we're at 16,941 listeners just on this show. We are only 3,059 listeners away from 20,000. So if I get to 20,000 before the end of the month, I'm going for 30,000 by the end of the year simply because I'm greedy and I want to get my guest all the exposure that is possible because I want to see them succeed. Overall, with all the podcast and the show, we are, at, as of this morning, 27,982 listeners, only 2,000 away from 30,000. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have to thank you so much for your continued support and for my guests, I love them, I appreciate them, and y'all are very important to me. Now let's do a little bit of um, promoting for a sponsor that I have, and his name is Darren Cox. He is an author, and his book is called Don't Let the Enemy Steal From You, A Crown of Thorns to a Crown of Righteousness. Don't let any man, anything, or let any situation in your life ever steal the things that God has ordained for you to have. One of the many great things of my generation that I see, one of the great things that breaks my heart is I see a generation that has no idea of the destiny and the future and the hope that God has for our generation. I look at young people in hopelessness. There is so much. We have the cars. We have the entertainment. We have the lights. We have everything that the world could offer a generation, and yet there's never been a generation more unhappy and more depressed. Ladies and gentlemen, go get this book and give it to your your kids and let them read it, and let's get this generation of young people on the right road. So now, without further ado, this is this young man's first talk show. When I I found out about him, I I was just amazed because to be as young as he is and to do the things he's done, he is an inspiration to me as old as I am and he should be an inspiration to all of you his name is David Cummer he is an author 
And ladies and gentlemen, he is a teenager. And he does have a couple of published novels and a collection of short stories out there already. This is as a teenager. Wait till this young man gets in his 20s and 30s. He is going to be flying all over the place. He lives in a small river town on the Ohio River in southern Indiana. And he not only does this young man write and publish, but he takes care of his younger siblings. No, there's not just one or two, ladies and gentlemen. There's eight. I'm the oldest of five. I took care of four. I cannot imagine taking care of eight. But he makes time for his writing in between his school and sports. He's been writing since he was young. I'm not sure how young. I'm going to find out. And his first published work was As Trees Turned Away. The next one was She, S-H-E. That was his first published novel. And along with writing, he's an avid reader and watcher of all things horror, and he enjoys writing reviews on them. You might want to know his opinion. I like this kid already. When he's not writing, he enjoys talking with his hilarious friends and his amazing girlfriend, and he spends time with his family watching movies and working out to burn all the calories that he gets for meeting, of all things, ladies and gentlemen, Hawaiian rolls. That is one of my weaknesses, and I don't even like bread, but that is one of my own weaknesses. Yes, David, they are addicting. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get talking to this wonderful young man. David, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm very glad to be here. Well, I am I am so amazed at the things that you have accomplished in such a short so what I want to know and what other inquiring minds out there want to know is, was writing something you've always wanted to do? How did you get started? When did you get started? And why did you do it? Um, I started writing probably in one of the early grades in grade school. I would say probably second or third grade. My fourth and fifth grade teachers really stressed writing and reading in the classroom, and so that kind of gave me a love for literature and ultimately for writing it, because from an early age, I would read a story, and then I would want to, I would wonder, like, how it could have been different, or how it could have been if someone else wrote it, and so eventually, I I started writing books that were similar to, you know, other books, like, if I read Lord of the Rings, I would write a little fantasy book when I was um, 12 or 13 years old, and I just, I'd wow. take a notebook, and and I just write. That's how it started. Now, let me ask you this. You, or let me make this statement. You were truly, truly blessed to have teachers that emphasized reading and writing. Sadly, my teachers did not. That was back during the caveman days. And because of it, they they. They stymied my creative side because math was not my friend. So they took my my love of reading and writing away from me. So God love your teachers for bringing out that natural craft that you have within you and encouraging that. I don't know many teachers that do, and you just picked right up on it. When you were learning your craft, What were some of the books that you read that you wondered how could you do it different or how could the ending be different and why? Well, I I would always wonder about the ending. But in particular, there was a collection of short stories I read that um, they they were interesting, but they wasn't very well written. I won't name it just to save the author some grace. But they were... I, he was probably three or four collection of short stories, and I read them, and I thought these are these are really good concepts, and the plot is good, but it's just not written very well. And so I kind of wondered how my writing would stack up to that, you know, like if it was something that you, I could learn or if it was something that just was natural. And so I started writing, and I started trying to improve my writing and read books on writing to become better at that because I I'd always thought that making a good plot or something wasn't that hard. You know, you get it right if you tried enough. But then getting the actual 
writing part down and making it interesting was the difficult part. That is very true. The, the plot could be, in most cases, the easy part, but then you <coughs> – I'm sorry – Excuse me. But then you have to incorporate your setting, your characters, your dialogue. And in in incorporating your characters, do you find that it's difficult to make them three-dimensional? Because we as human beings are not one-dimensional. We are three-dimensional. So how hard was it for you to define your characters as three-dimensional people? Yeah, there there are some cases of writing what I've, what I've done and I would start a book and I just couldn't get involved with the characters. I didn't, I didn't feel for them a lot. And so it's a lot hard to make them three dimensional when you don't feel for them. And so one of the books, one of the books I wrote called um, my Abigail, I really, I really feel like that's the best book I've written in terms of characters because I feel, I just really connected with the characters and I felt sad when they felt sad and I felt afraid when they were afraid. And so connecting with them helped. Did you find that your characters were talking to you in your head? Yeah, I I would think about them a lot throughout the day and think about what they would do in certain situations and, you know. Let me ask you this. Now, I was reading about you on your your website. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I about fell out on the floor when I read this because this young man has – he had an interesting experience when he was six, seven years old. What did you find? Where did you find it? And what did you do when you found it? Well, we were at the school playground in, I think, either kindergarten or first grade. And we were messing around on the monkey bars, and there was mulch there, you know. So one of us fell down and was looking through the mulch. And still to this day, um, we have arguments over whether we found a like a, a human finger bone or if it was just a strange looking piece of stick. I, I tend to believe it was not. A, I tend to believe it was not a stick. Some of my friends did not, but it was still. It, it was strange. It was a weird experience. Well, would you base based on that experience? Did you ever consider writing either a short story or a novella or a full-length novel based on that find? That would be an interesting concept. I I thought about it. There's lots of little experiences like that that I thought about, and I wrote them down in a document. So if I'm going through a novel and I can add little scenes like that in somewhere, I've done that with other scenes in my novels. I haven't used the human finger yet, but... I'm sure it's coming. You'll, you'll, you'll recognize it. <laughs> I, I, I haven't read any of David's books yet, but I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, I will be downloading his books because you wrote your first horror novel at 14. Am I correct? Um, I think I think it was 14, yes. Tell me about it. Um, the short story collection or the novel? Both. Both. Okay. We got time. Um, oh, the yeah. Short story collection, the short story collection was actually, it was going to be called the alphabet at first because each each story starts with the letter of the alphabet, the title does. And so I was I was writing along. I started somewhere in the middle. I started at like L, and then I wrote a couple, and I went back to A, and I just I jumped back and forth. So in the end, there were 26 short stories. And some of them, some of them have common plots like story one and three and nine or whatever will all be together but that was I wrote that collection of stories because of the short story collection that I talked about earlier where I thought I might be able to do a better job and so I took some I had lots of little ideas floating around nothing that I thought I could make a novel out of and so I kind of threw them all into a pot and mixed it up and came up with a short story collection and this is all horror short stories Yes, they are. Some of them, some of them are scarier than others. I try not to put too much gore or anything, too much blood and guts, because I don't really find it. Sometimes it's just distracting. It's not as scary. So I try to avoid that as much as possible for anyone that's nervous about that. 
and and that brings me to another question. You do reviews on horror on horror movies, and because you are a horror fan, do you find that the more they do the special effects with all of the blood, the guts, the flying arms, the severed heads, the the who know the entrails trailing behind? Do you find that more distracting? as opposed to it being left to the viewer's imagination. Oh, oh no. And hiding their face and, and missing half of the movie. Yeah. I mean, it really, it, to me, I don't really like it. I guess there are some people who they would, they would go watch the movie just for the purpose of being scared by blood and guts and stuff. Because I mean, there are some movies that the whole point of that is, but if you're making a movie where you're trying to actually scare people, I don't think blood and guts are the best way to do it. Because most of the time, they take up space that could be used for a better plot or for better characters. Because, like, if I don't care about the person, I won't really care if their head comes flying off. I'll just be <laughs> I like your honesty. All right, well, let's take a step back in time. You've probably never seen this movie, but it is a a classic, and it is one of my favorites. It was the first horror movie that I ever went to see, and I was, I want to say, 13. Now, I'm 67 now, so that's date me, David, and I don't mind being dated. But I went to the movie to see Edgar Allan Poe's The House of Usher with uh, Vincent Price, who is the all-time master of horror. I actually... I haven't seen that movie, but I have read the short story it's based off of. So okay, relate. so you can relate to the plot line, the storyline, and the characters. So when I yep. went to see that movie, that movie scared me to death. And the reason it scared me to death was not because of of the blood and the gore, because there was none. But it was the movie, it was the setting, and it was the constant fingernails that you heard on the coffin of the female character trying to get out of the coffin. Yes. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons that some of the older movies are better is because they couldn't rely on blood and guts, and so they had to make a good story to really scare people. Exactly. And I, I think we've lost some of that with all of the, the the pyrotechnics and the special effects and the this and the that. We've completely gotten away from horror storytelling. Yeah, I mean the same the same could really be said for most genres, because even like even some sci-fi movies nowadays, you know, but they have so many special effects, but the same kind of characters and the same plot isn't there that was there 20 or 30 years ago. Very true. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a wise young man. Take heed to what he's saying because when someone his age can relate to what I'm saying about about horror and, and other genres in the, in the movie industry and what we have lost and, and, and gained and which is not much because we've lost the art of storytelling in our movies it's all now special effects blow up cars blood guts and severed heads one of the one of the television series i absolutely hate i hate it with a passion the walking dead how many damn zombies can you kill (laughs) i actually i haven't i haven't watched it much because i don't most of the time we don't watch like um Stuff that's on television right now. We watch rent movies or whatever. But I've heard I've heard a lot about it. I have a lot of friends that watch it. You know. Well, the, it, 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 the, there's no plot line. There's there's no there's no storyline. It's based off DC Comics, and there's absolutely no storyline. There's no there's no hope. There's no there's no nothing. It's just a, a bunch of people running around killing zombies and each other. To me, that's boring. The House of Usher told a story. Yeah, I I do like I like to go back and um, watch some older movies, some older shows, and read some older books to break up. Um, you know, I still I still watch new movies and stuff, but I like to break them up with older movies and watching the original stuff like that, like a little book. Let, let me ask you this: Who are some of the authors that you have read? 
that you really enjoy? Um, well, I'll start off by saying the Harry Potter author, J.K. Rowling, which is probably the answer that everybody gives. But I, I particularly like those books because of the dialogue and the characters, because she has some of the best characters and the best, um, you know, they're really, they're really lifelike characters, which is why mm-hmm. they can make so many, you know, movies and spinoffs and stuff off of it. Besides her, um, honestly, there's not – the only horror author I read that, like, I'm, I read his books specifically is a guy named Mark Edwards. I don't read much of the um, big-time authors like Stephen King or anybody. Not, I'm not sure why I just don't. But I read a lot of Mark Edwards, and then in fantasy, I read a lot of um, Christopher Paolini. He wrote the Aragon series. Why do you like Mark Edwards? What is it about his books? Now you've read you've read Poe, which is my favorite all time author because yes. he's horror. He's he's um, he he's love. He's he's depression. He's just a well rounded author. So in reading Poe and then reading Edwards, how do you compare them? Um, Edwards. A couple, a couple of his books, I've, pro- I've probably read about seven or eight of them. The first couple I read, I really liked because they were, they were some of his older stuff. Nowadays, a lot of his books are kind of recycled material, which I don't like as much. So I haven't read as much of his lately. So I would say the older authors like Poe, I never see any of their work like have the same plot lines or the same storylines. It's always, it's always a new feeling when I read one of their books. Some of the authors nowadays, if I read two of their books, I feel like I'm reading the same one. And that that has become a problem all across traditional publishers um, yeah. and, and, and mainstream every, authors. Every yeah, yeah, because what happens is they're under such constraints to get out, some of them, four books a year, that they recycle. Okay. And when they recycle, all you have to do is read the back and know it's the same book. Well, there's there's some authors like um, James Patterson comes to mind. He publishes a new book every month, just about. Mhm. And yeah. and if you look, it's recycled, and he brings in these unknowns to to write the book for him. He gives them the plot line, they write the book. And sadly, in my opinion, my husband re- used to read a lot of James Patterson. And sadly, he's lost that flair, that depth, that three-dimensional thing that he had going on when he first started out. Yeah, if I, if I go and read a popular author, normally I'll backtrack five or ten years and read some of their older stuff. Because, you know, they, 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 have, they have some good books. That's why they're popular authors. But mm-hmm. I don't read everything they publish now. Let me let's let's just back up into your history a little bit because I'm I'm intrigued. Like I like I said earlier in the conversation, I am the oldest of five siblings, and I've raised those four. Helped my mother raise those four siblings. One of them is mentally and physically challenged. That was hard because there was 13 months difference between myself and and that particular brother and then it went on down the line with the youngest one being 11 years younger than I am it was hard looking after four siblings and and being in a household with four siblings and growing up with four siblings please tell me that you're superman because you have eight siblings correct yeah um I'm definitely not superman I would say that goes to my mom (laughs) Because she does a lot, she does a whole lot, whole lot more than I do. And so, t- the, the so tell me how that works. works. Um, well, there's a lot of just getting through the day, getting through the week. <laughs> because the the hard part isn't having the eight siblings. The hard part is that um, I don't know exactly how many, but three or three or four of them are all under the age of three or age of four. So there's a lot of young ones which may, always makes it hard. Oh, bless you, my child. You have all these little stair steps running around in 20 different circles, right? Oh, yeah, it's always noisy. It's just <laughs> quiet at our house. Something's probably wrong. All right, so that being said, my friend, 
with 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 the wee ones and 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 all of the activity that's going on in a normal household day, how in the world do you find a quiet corner to write in, or do you just block out the noise? Um, I do not find a quiet corner. Normally, I just find a couch, and I will I'll block out the noise. Or um, so, sometimes it's quieter. Like in the evenings, if I do writing at night, it's normally quieter. But sometimes during the day, I'll be typing, and I'll have a kid hanging on my arm, and you know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you have a lot of courage, and and I I admire you so much because it's tough with me taking care of my husband who is disabled, and it's just the two of us in the house. But to have eight siblings with three or four of them under the age of four, I admire you. You are a strong young man. Let's talk about. You again for a few minutes. Are you taking any writing courses? Um, are you taking anything in in school that that enhances your craft? What are you doing to make yourself a better author? Um, well, like I said, I had those really good teachers in elementary school. I've got I got really lucky all through elementary school. All my teachers were really good. They really you know they they understood the importance of reading and writing. And now my um, English, my English teacher, all through high school so far, I'm I'm going to be a junior next year. So I've had her for five years. She also is like that. She really she loves reading. She loves writing. She always gives us these um, writing assignments that are, you know, for me they're really fun because it's like it's stuff that I do anyways on my own time. And then this coming school year, I'm going to take a college writing course through a local um, university. So that'll be interesting. I've never done anything like that before. Congratulations. I'm so envious. And I am so yeah, proud just, of you. The school has a great setup with the college where we can take, you know, you can take dual credit courses there and get um, credits for high school and college. And so I saw they had a writing course, and you know, I get school for it, and, and I enjoy it. Well, are you going to – Go on to college when you graduate. What are your plans? I know you're going to keep writing because as a writer, that's what we do. But what other long-range goals do you have in mind? Um, yeah, I'm I'm still figuring out a career. I've looked into various things. Library sciences books are interesting right now. I'm, I'm friends with a librarian in town, and it seems like a career that would be um, something I'd enjoy and something that – you know, it would still leave me with time to write, which most kids don't grow up and say, I want to be a librarian. But, you know, I mean, it's something that would work for me, and I would enjoy it. And you could be a mentor to our future and encourage them to follow their dream, whether it's writing, music, art, being a business person, because you've been allowed to follow your dream, which is magnificent. So let's let's talk about your dreams. Let's talk about as trees turned away. What is that about? Um, well, there's I think there's about thirteen different storylines that go on through it <clears throat> through the twenty six stories, and they, it really it jumps all over the place. There's there's murderers, there's ghosts, there's hauntings. Um, I don't think there's any vampires in there, so sorry, vampire lovers. But there's if you if you can think of it in a scary movie, it's probably in the book somewhere in some story. Interesting. What about she, a horror novel? Um, yeah, and why that's the title? The, that's the first one I wrote. I actually I was planning the book around the same time. I read. I've only read one Stephen King novel, and that was it. And I, I was in a phase. You know, I liked the idea of having one-word titles that were vague and mysterious. And so I came up with this book, and I thought, what should I name this? And I thought, oh well, she. That's, you know, that's one word. It's vague. It's mysterious. And so that's that's how the title happened. The so, with, without giving away the entire book. Why would someone want to read it? What it is? What is it about? Well, I 
this is the one book that I really remember how I came up with the idea for it. Some of the other ones I'm kind of fuzzy. fuzzy. I'm like, how did I how did I think of this? But for <laughs> she, I remember <clears throat> specifically, it was a Friday night, and I had cross country practice the next morning on Saturday. So Friday night, I was looking out my window at the street below me, and I kind of live out like almost to the country, but not quite. And so there's a there's a field on the other side, and there's a street light. And I was thinking that's like a that's a really creepy looking scene there. It'd be like what if somebody was standing there watching me? And so that scene shows up in the book. And then the next morning, we went to cross country practice, and we were down by this old stone bridge with a um, little ri- little river running through it and I thought that's another really creepy scene and so that also comes into the book towards the end and so I kind of took those two scenes and put them together I made oh my I created a main character named Michael and his three friends that were all teenagers and basically there's this um, old lady this creepy old lady who lives in the forest in their town and every um, she comes and takes their she, she takes Michael's sister and so they have to go and get her back. And there's a lot of there's a lot of more mysterious history to it. Like they start they discover um, some secrets about her, some secrets about their town. But that but the basic idea for it all came from the street light outside my window. Oh, you have such a wonderful imagination. <laughs> now you say in your bio that the the one that your novella that you were most proud of is called My Abigail. What is it about and why are you most proud of it? Um, the funny thing about this book is I honestly have no idea how I came up with it. I I remember I thought about a certain I remember thinking about a certain plot point. I can't give it away because it's a big twist about three fourths of the way through the book. But that's that's what I started. What the, that's what the book started from. That was a little seed. As for like the characters and everything, I have no idea how I came up with them. But the premise of it is there's Caleb, who is a he's a teenager. I normally write with teenage protagonists, and he lives in a small river town. Sounds familiar, but he's not me. I promise. And he's um. <laughs> He he's, he gets bullied. He's kind of a shy kid. He hasn't had that many friends because he's kind of new in town. But then he meets this girl named Abigail, who is it's it's like a teenage romance type thing. But they don't you know they, they don't they don't admit they like each other of course because they're teenagers. Of course. And so she's she's um, you know she's this perfect girl type of idea. But then he starts to discover secrets about her, and she actually weird all the time. She's never tells him where she's going. She disappears for weeks on end. And so he eventually discovers, you know, why that is. And that's that's when the book becomes it goes from being, you know, this feel good story to being really serious and frightening. And there's no there's no big bad guy in the book, but it's a it's trust me, it's still scary. It's scary enough without the bad guy. I love the way you think. You are so interesting. Now, in June, ladies and gentlemen, this young man released a new book called Cold Gray Eyes. Now, when I saw that, I'm thinking, this is not a teenager. This has to be an adult in a teenager's body because just the title alone made me want to go out and get it. So tell me about this book. Um, Cold Gray Eyes is something I actually wrote. I wrote Cold Gray Eyes before I wrote Abigail. I wrote it over on vacation over the course of a week a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, maybe a, week and a year and a half. And so it's been, it was, it's been sitting on my computer for a year and a half. There's, there's actually two of them, Cold Gray Eyes and Cool Gray Eyes, which is the sequel. They're both short um, novellas. And they were just sitting there together. So I, I, kinda, I was reading through some old documents. I found them. And I decided I would edit, I would polish them up and rewrite it and publish it. So the the story is there's a family that goes out to a campsite in the woods. They've heard good things about it. You know they're they're excited. They they have some problems of their own, but they're doing all right. 
and they get there, and there's this, um, they're the only ones there in this campsite. There, it's about six cabins all around a lake. And the only other person there is the camp owner named Mr. Tilo and his dog. So that's how it starts. Things start, start to go bad. And what you think would happen is the camp owner would kill them or something. Or he would, you know, he would, he would drown them, he would burn their house, anything like that. But that's not what happened. Because there is another person in this campsite that they don't know about and Mr. Tilo doesn't know about. And the question throughout the book is, how does this person, this mysterious figure, relate to this mysterious camp owner, Mr. Tilo? And so that comes, that starts to develop to the first book and the second book, and it will be resolved next summer in the third book. Oh, my goodness. So you're just going to keep us hanging until next summer. That's just cruel, you know, right, David? That That is that is the the epitome of a great writer that they just keep their readers hanging which is cruel and unusual and should be against the law but we do it and I love it it's, it's cruel but that's what happens when school gets in the way oh you are so smooth just let you school as your excuse like that. <laughs> now you run you run cross country is that what I understood you to say? Yes, I, I run cross country. How did you get started in that? Um, well, my my grandpa is like um, he's not he's not quite Indiana Hall of Fame, but he's the next level under that in cross country. So he everyone knows him around here, and cross country has been in our family for a long time. So I kind of was naturally um, inclined to it. But then also I play basketball, and so running throughout the summer helps a ton with basketball, being more in shape mm-hmm. for that. That's the main reason I do it. When when you're training, do you find that while you're running, because ladies and gentlemen, cross country literally means they run distances. How many miles is cross country, David? It can be anywhere from two to five or two to ten. Yeah, the the race distances are three miles, but we'll do other races throughout the summer that are like five miles, ten, ten miles, stuff like that. So David's got a lot of, of time on his hands while he's running because he can't whip out his computer and, and write his thoughts down. And he's he's trying to win this race because he's in it with with how many other kids are you in it with? Um, the the big races will have probably seventy or eighty. The small ones will have twenty or thirty. So any anywhere between those. So not only are you in competition with these kids, but you're in competition with yourself to do the best that you can. Yeah. While you're running, do you find yourself thinking about plot lines and characters? And and if you do, does that help you motivate you to push yourself even more? Um, I will think about it during practice most of the time. You know, if I'm if I'm training for if I'm training for an upcoming race, sometimes my mind will drift to that, and I'll have to I'll have to keep it there until I get done and I can write it down or something. But then. During the race, normally I can't think of anything because I'm just dead. <laughs> you just you just running. When do you find that cross country has and, and basketball has helped you with the discipline that you need to be a, a good writer to make yourself write to sit down and do it even when you'd rather do something else. Yeah, I, I would say so. Sports, sports helps a lot with self-discipline and with, you know, making your, making yourself do things even when you don't always feel like it. So they've helped a lot with that. And then writing, in turn, has helped me be more disciplined for basketball and cross country. So they kind of complement each other in terms of training. Well, I tell you what, I am I am very impressed, and I, I mean that sincerely because. 
I've been writing for a long time. I've been in this business for a long time. I've been writing since I could pick up a pencil and write my name. And to see someone your age that is now a published author of one, two, three, four, four books, and you you haven't even scratched the surface yet. You've just started on this journey. It's so amazing to me, and I admire you so much for it. And with that being said, I would like for you to give your wisdom, and and yes, you do have knowledge and wisdom, even as young as you are, you have a lot of knowledge and wisdom, to impart your wisdom and your knowledge to some other young person out there that's got a dream that feels like they're floundering because A, they don't have the self-discipline, B, they don't know how to do it, C, they're afraid to ask, or even D, they've been put down for their dream rather than fortunately like you have not been encouraged. With what you have under your belt now, how would you go about talking to someone about making their dream real? Um, I would say... The number one way to help yourself be more disciplined and stuff is to just really enjoy it because a lot of times when you're trying to follow your dream, as you said, whether that's writing or, um, really, I mean, any other career path that people normally don't choose or even just a hobby that people don't really appreciate, if you listen to other people and you let them convince you that it's not worth it or that you should be doing something else, you're not going to enjoy it and eventually you're going to give it up. But if it's something that you actually enjoy, you have to you have to focus on. I mean, I'll I'll say writing writing as an example. You could be writing a book and you could be refreshing your sales page every day and focusing on if you're selling books or if people are reviewing your book, stuff like that. But if you're not focusing on the book you're writing and you're not focusing on the things that make it fun, like characters, then you're not going to enjoy it and you're not going to keep up keep doing it. And would it be safe to say that it, if you, if one is not focused on uh, on writing, let's stay with that since that's what we both do and relate to. If you're not focused on that, and you just haphazardly do it, just like we talked about earlier, it comes through in your finished work. It's not your best. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I can tell, like, even. Even within one book I write, I can tell it when I'm when I'm rereading a chapter. I can tell if I was really focused on it then, or if I was just kind of getting it done because it was something I was supposed to do that day. I can tell even, you know, just from page to page. I can tell how much work I put into it. And when you find out that you haven't given it your best shot, do you get mad at yourself? I do get frustrated sometimes because I'm like, man, I could be. Like this could be so much better if I had just done it right the first time, but ultimately you just have to go back through and you have to correct everything that you did wrong. And so, you know, you you think about that next time you write, next time you you sit down to write and you're thinking, well, I really need to focus on this chapter because if not, I'm going to have to come back and do it again later and do it better. Now, it, being a young person, it's it's hard enough out here in the real world as an adult, but being a young person and with peer pressure being what it is in this day and age, are you um, encouraged by your friends or do they make fun of you when you say, well, I've got to finish this chapter, I can't go out and hang out with you because I've got to do this right now? Or do they say, okay, when you get through, come join us? How do your friends react and interact with you with your craft? Um, I've, I, my friends are pretty good about it. Sometimes they're kind of look at me weird. They're like, do you, do you really have to do that? Are you, are you messing around? I'm like, no, I actually have to go do this. And they're kind of they're like, oh, right, I guess so. But they, they, I don't think – no one's made fun of me yet for it. They, they're just kind of – they don't really know how to react because it's not something you hear every day. <laughs> because they don't understand you. <laughs> and I get that yeah. because – 
unless unless they are writers themselves, they don't understand that that drive and that need that we have to be either with a pencil and piece of paper in our hand or a computer in our hand or a tablet in our hand or something on our hand to put down the words that won't shut up in our minds. Yeah, some, sometimes they're like, hey, do you mean you're doing homework? I'm like, no, I'm writing a book for fun. They're like, oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> They don't appreciate it. Have they read any of your work? Um, there's a couple. There's a couple of them that have. And then, and then you know, there are some people that are like, "Oh, I want a book, so I'll I'll give them one." And then they never read it because you know, they're teenagers. It happens. I do it too. I'll get a book and then I just I just don't look at it. But then, don't you later go back and and look for something to read? And there's that book, and you just have to read yeah. it. Just eventually yeah, I go back read it. And like, oh. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll read that. There, and there you found some, that is- um, there, there's some adults adults at the school that have read my books and reviewed it and stuff, especially since I got Facebook a lot more now. You know, they see it a lot more that way. I think probably the week I got Facebook, I probably had 30 people saying to me, oh, I didn't know you were a writer. I'm like, yeah, I have been. <laughs> For a long time. Yeah, so- they just don't hear about it. But see, now they will because you you will wind up being heard in over 70 countries. And never be ashamed to say, I am a writer. Never Don't hide your craft under that tree. You know, they said, don't hide your light under a bushel. Shout it to the rooftops, David, because you have an opportunity at an age that most kids – don't you you have broken into this business at a very young age and you will only grow exponentially from here somewhere down the road i'm going to say yeah i interviewed him on my radio show way back when and and <laughs> so i want you to get business cards you can get them from vista print get business cards and hand them out and say read my books ladies and And i want everybody in my listening audience to go on amazon and order this young man's books because you admit you ladies and gentlemen i'm always telling you that young people are our future i'm speaking to my future this young man is our future he is already moving in that direction in the present. So he is going to be someone that you're going to want to watch because I see Mr. David going very, very far. Yeah, I've been trying to do more um, community events. Like I had a, I had a book signing at a library recently, more stuff like that. It's kind of hard in town because there's only one bookstore in town really. And it's, um, the dude that owns it is very much against Amazon. So, you know, it's kind of hard when you're published through Amazon, but I've found some, um, some other places. Well, you can also, did you know, you can also do like a virtual book tour and you can do it on Facebook or you could even do it on your webpage where you do a book tour and you get people to come in and ask questions and you talk about your book and then you give them the link and they can go to Amazon and buy it. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing I've been um, doing this summer especially is getting more um, online opportunities or stuff like this where it's, you know, through a phone call. Oh, absolutely. I, I I'm going to tell you what, I am just, I am honored that you agreed to come on the show tonight because I know you're very, very busy. And to to have you on the show as an example of two things, well, several things, but the two main things is, A, you're part of my future, and you are putting yourself out there as a writer, so that gives my future more books to read. And also you are not afraid to follow your dream, even as young as you are, regardless of what the rest of the world says, you have proven that you're disciplined enough to make this dream happen. And you're doing the things to make it happen, even incorporating the disciplines of basketball and and cross country, taking college writing courses 
and you're an, you're an example to other young people that no matter what dream they want, they can achieve that just by doing simple things like being disciplined with things they do in school. Yeah, it's there's there's a lot to learn still, but it's been it's been really fun so far. And you know, as soon as soon as I kind of made up my mind that I was going to do it, it it just became something that I had to keep working on. Well, I am very proud of you, David. I am extremely, and I will be watching you, and I will also be promoting you, and I will be reading your books and writing reviews and sending you those reviews because I see you going far. You are a very mature young man, and I just can't wait to see more out of coming out of your works and things that you're going to do with your life. Well, I really appreciate it, and opportunities like this are they're always fun to have, and there's stuff that I can look back on you know later on when I have a book, and I can say, oh, I haven't been on haven't been on that show for a while or I haven't you know and and, and you're coming back i'm yeah, I'm bringing you back on this show. I, you will be a regular on this show i I would like to it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, we, we we never know what we're going to say on this show. And speaking of fun, we're going to run out of time here shortly. Remember at the first of the show, I said there's going to come a time when I'm going to say our time is getting short, and you're going to say the hour flew by? Yeah. The hour, has flown by. Yeah. the hour has flown by. What I would like for you to do is um, let the folks know where you can be found. And where your books yep. can be ordered. Well, the the books are on Amazon only right now. But because they're only on Amazon, I don't know if um, any of you have Kindle Unlimited. It's a subscription where you can read books for free, basically. All, all of my books are in that. And I think all of my books are 99 cents except for the short story collection. So they're cheaper than a drink at McDonald's. That, Can't beat that um, with a stick. Yep. The um to find me, you you can email me at davidcoomer7 at gmail dot com. I'm really active on the email. I answer you know whatever few emails I get. There's um if you go to davidcoomer dot com, my website, that's the main place you're going to find me. You can sign up for a newsletter. You can read articles, read um, movie reviews, see more about me. And there's even a link that will take you over to my other website, which is only for horror. So if you're one of the horror fans listening and you want to see, like, book trailers and new new releases, stuff like that, that's on my horror website. But you can find you can find everything you want to find at davidcoomer.com. And also and on Facebook. Awesome. Yeah. And please, ladies and gentlemen, friend this young man on Facebook. <sighs> Support him as part of your future. This is very important. And, yes, David will be coming back after the first of the year. I can't wait to read his book so we can talk about him in great depth. Tomorrow night, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to have a new author. She's not a new author. She's been out there a while. But she is from across the pond. She is from merry old England. Our show tomorrow night will run from 5 to 6 because there is quite a bit of time difference. So from 5 to 6 tomorrow evening, Miss Tiffany Shand and I will be having a conversation for an hour. On Friday night, I will be off because my guest had to cancel. She had a funeral she had to attend. But on Saturday night, my guest is K.M. Johnson from 8 till 9. We'll be back to our regular scheduled time. She is an inspirational speaker, and I know that y'all want to listen in on that one. Um now, David, I want to thank you so much, my young friend, for agreeing to spend an hour with me. I am very honored and humbled, and I appreciate so much you coming on the show and, and talking with me, and I cannot wait to have you back on the show. Yeah, it was it was great. I love coming and doing this. It's really fun. It's also well, a good practice for book signings and stuff like that. 
Absolutely. It absolutely is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know how I feel about our future. You know how I feel about our young people. They all have a purpose. You know that it is very important to me that we protect our young people, encourage them in their dreams, and help them achieve those dreams because without them, we will not have people like David who are writers. We will not have scientists. We will not have presidents. We will not have doctors nor teachers nor newspaper people nor garbage collectors nor builders. So get out there and help support these young people. They are amazing. And they're jewels, they're diamonds in the rough. And and for David to come on the show and to talk to me, it just, it makes me very, very proud. So at the end of my show, you all know that I say several things. And David, you can write these down and, and feel free to plagiarize them because I did. And one of the things that I always say is don't just feel special, be special. And if you want to achieve greatness, don't ask permission. Young David did not ask permission. He just did it. He achieved greatness and success even as young as he is because he did not ask permission. He just went out and did it. And this is what you have to do, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be afraid to jump in the deep end. Right, David? Yep. Jump in the deep end. And you'll swim. Trust me, you'll swim. Also, I always say that there are several things in life that we carry with us everywhere. And one of them is this. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. How you leave others feeling after having an experience with you, ladies and gentlemen, that does indeed become your business card. And if you don't believe that... All you have to do is listen to this show, listen to the guests like David that keep coming back, that have fun, because they never know what I'm going to ask them. They, they really don't. It's a leap of faith for them because they have no idea, but they love it. They have fun with it. And if, if someone is having a bad day, smile at them. Tell them how nice they look. And if a young person is having a bad day, especially a young person, Be kind to them because we may have someone like David that is our next Ernest Hemingway or our next Edgar Allan Poe or one of our next big-name movie reviewers. Would that be a fair statement, David? Yeah, you never never know who you're going to meet. That's one of the things they always tell you. That is very true. And ladies and gentlemen, understand this. This young man goes to school, and and in order to take college courses, don't you have to have a pretty high GPA? Yeah, yeah, it's got to be up there a little bit. And in order to participate in sports, don't you have to have a pretty high GPA? Yeah, yeah, sports, you have to have one too. So ladies and gentlemen, this young man not only goes to school every day, carries a great GPA, he is a basketball player, a cross-country runner, takes care of, helps his mom take care of eight siblings, some of them little stair steps, four years and under, wee ones, plus he is a published author. Now, the next adult that tells me I have a dream but I'm going to say, did you not listen to my show with young David? You are an inspiration, my young friend. And for that, I thank you very, very much. Thanks. I'm I'm just glad to be on the show. I'm glad hopefully some people will listen, you know. And I'd love to talk to anybody. I'd love to talk to anybody after the show on email or Facebook or anything else. You know, I'm always open to chat. So you heard it first here, ladies and gentlemen. Friend him on Facebook under David Kummer, K-U-M-M-E-R. Go to Amazon, look up his books under David Kummer, K-U-M-M-E-R, 
And I will be having this young man back, I promise, because I am going to download his books and I am going to read them. And then we'll have a discussion about them because I can guarantee you they're going to be fantastic. So until tomorrow night, remember, special show, 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We will be talking to Tiffany Shands. This is Yvonne Mason with her guest, David Kummer. And this is Off the Chain. And we say good evening. So now we're off the we are off the air now, David. But anything we say is going to go up into the archive show. But I wanted to remind you: as soon as we hang up from here, I will get the show up in archives. I'll post it on my page. I will tag you in it. You can download the show. You can also send it out, put it on your web page, do whatever you want to yep. with it. But use it to market yourself. Tomorrow, when I put the podcast up, do the same thing. I definitely will. All right, sweetheart, and thank you again. You are an amazing guest. I was, it was really fun, so thank you for having me on the show, and I will You're welcome. be back soon. Yes, you will, and we'll talk later. All right. Good night, honey.